Welcome everyone. Welcome to the UMass Core Facility Seminar Series. Today, we are hosting the UMass Water and Energy Technology Center. This is a multi-purpose facility that has many types of equipment and water samples available for use by both UMass and non-UMass researchers. We will be learning about their unique capabilities with Director Patrick Whitbold. In addition, Michael Murphy from X2O Corp will be sharing the technology, developing a low-cost smartphone-based water quality sensor. I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. We hope that with these biweekly seminars, you will discover what great resources that the centralized UMass Amherst Corp facilities office, offers to our campus community, the New England region and beyond. And next, just a few housekeeping items. The seminar is being recorded as you just heard. All replays of the seminars in the series can be found on our website. I will put the link in the chat. We will save the Q&A till the end of the presentation. During that time, I welcome you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Next, I would like to introduce you to the director of our core facilities, Andrew Bernard. Andrew? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for joining us for the fifth of the fall 2021 core facility seminars. As Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrew Bernard and I'm the director of the centralized core facilities here at UMass Amherst. Today, we'll be discussing the UMass Water and Energy Technology Center, a non-centralized core with a wide range of resources available to both on and off campus users. While my primary responsibility is to advocate for the 30 centralized cores, I appreciate that there are a significant amount of resources throughout campus that the research community can take advantage of and hope to share more of them as we move forward. I'm privileged to share the information on our state-of-the-art labs, instrumentation, equipment, and world-class experts who are helping researchers at UMass and beyond drive discovery and pursue scientific endeavors across all disciplines. We hope by learning more in these seminars, you'll find ways to use these resources to accomplish your research goals. To help access our cores, there are several funding opportunities. For IELTS investigators, core credits and center seed funding is available to access the centralized cores. For our external users, the Mass Innovation, Innovation Voucher Program subsidizes usage for small companies based in Massachusetts at up to 75%. In the three years, three plus years of the voucher program, uh, the wet center has been able to re receive about 20 vouchers, which represents about a million dollars worth of work uh, subsidized from the state. Uh, it's a quick chance to mention that next Tuesday, November 9th from three to 5 p.m., the UMass President's Office will be hosting the next uh, seminar series, which is going to be an overview of all five campus core facilities uh, and the resources they have, uh, hearing from some of our leaders, including uh, President Marty Meehan, and also hearing from a few of our users that have taken advantage of the core facilities over the last few years. So I'll put a link to that uh, in the chat and hope you'll be able to join us there to learn a little bit more about what we do. Please feel free to reach out to me uh, at any time or any of the core facilities directors uh, directly if you have any questions or would like to find out more about how you can engage and work with us. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Patrick Whipple who'll tell you a bit more about the Wet Center uh, and introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Patrick. Hello, thank you all for joining me and thank you, Andrew, for inviting the, the Wet Center. Um, to give this presentation. Uh, my name is Patrick Whitbold. I act as the director of the Water and Energy Technology Center. Uh, we also have the, the co-director, David Reckow, on the call, who is the um, original founder of the Wet Center and helped to help me get this off the ground. Uh, so the, the, the Wet Center, um, in, in a way, stems out of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, we have the Environmental and Water Resources Engineering Research Group, who has done um, all sorts of uh, conventional uh, treatment studies for the past uh, 50 plus years. And the wet center is a field site on the far reaches of campus near the town of Amherst wastewater treatment plant um, and the Mill River, uh, where we have access to, to real water sources to conduct um, studies at much larger scale than is possible in a conventional laboratory. Um, so what does the wet center provide? We provide a location for researchers, entrepreneurs, and companies to test new technologies in water treatment. Um, our, our main lifeblood here is that we have real water sources, including a local river, three different types of municipal wastewater, uh, a rainwater collection system, and also access to the campus uh, reuse system, which uses reverse osmosis uh, treated water that um, came from the town of Amherst wastewater treatment plant. Um, our facility is a small building um, and field site. So we have a, about an acre property and a um, this is several thousand square foot um, garage for lack of a better term that we um, open to researchers or private companies to come rent space and use our, um, our water sources, our tools, treatment tech devices, as well as our laboratory there um, to uh, 
uh, get their technologies to a more commercial uh, ready level, T uh, technology readiness level, TRL, which many of you are probably familiar with um, in the develop R and D world. Um, the the wet center uh, is actually founded uh, originally as the wastewater pilot plant in the early 70s, but was uh, offline from 1985 until 2015, and in 2016. Um, we did a modest renovation to get the center uh, up and running. Um, our focus has always been um, treatment of contaminated water, but uh, there's other areas of water treatment that we focus on. Um, so the, the main focuses are public drinking water treatment, uh, municipal and industrial wastewater treatment, um, industrial process water for power generation, things like the campus combined heat and power plant. Um, those facilities actually use a, a huge amount of water uh, in the U.S., and we, so we study that, that water uh, quite a bit. And then there's also the homeowner and consumer markets um, for things like swimming pools, home testing kits, under-the-sink uh, filtration devices. Um, so what makes us unique? Uh, location, uh, location, location. We'd be hard-pressed to find a um, facility that has the resources we have. Uh, uh, and to go into depth on that, you can see this is an overhead of the campus map. Our, we are tucked away on the western edge of campus by the Mill River, just north of the Town of Amherst wastewater treatment plant, and just south of the combined heat and power plant. Uh, and this unique location uh, gives us access to these, these real municipal um, entities uh, that all use water. And so, um, if you are a small water treatment startup and you need to say get wastewater to test your product, um, doing that is very challenging. Um, you have to make a relationship with a municipal wastewater treatment plant, get permission to either be on their site or um, come and collect wastewater from them. And then once you do your testing, you have to get rid of the wastewater, which is also uh, can be difficult depending on what's in it and your uh, local bylaws. Um, and there's just a illustration that we're next to the, the Mill River, which we use for our drinking water service. Um, so this is a uh, just a, a very simplistic CAD drawing of our site or um, layout of our site. You can see that we have three different uh, pipes that come from the town of Amherst wastewater treatment plant, giving us uh, what we call raw wastewater, primary effluent wastewater, and secondary or finished wastewater. Those are the three um, three types of wastewater that are of most interest uh, for R and D purposes. And then we have a withdrawal permit from the town of Hadley, which this Mill River is located in Hadley, not in Amherst. Uh, we have a withdrawal permit to take in um, up to 100,000 gallons per day of surface water. And um, this RO facility, this uh, red rectangle here, shows the central heating plants reuse treatment system. So they take wastewater from the town, treat it and uh, use it on campus um, in various locations, um, mostly at the um, central heating plant for their um, um, boiler makeup water. The water sources I just, I went into in a bit, so I won't stay here for too long, but I will make a uh, note that we have a rainwater collection system. We did a year long project where we installed a uh, um, commercial sized gutter system and collection system on the wet center building uh, roof. And had a student uh, do a master's thesis on um, evaluating the, uh, the types of pre treatment that's uh, available for rainwater systems and uh, evaluating their effectiveness. And we're, we are trying to get a deep water uh, well installed so that we can do groundwater studies, which is also a very relevant uh, water source to study. Uh, what makes us unique? Um, well, it's kind of like the first slide that Andrew went over. We have the core facilities on UMass campus is an incredible set of resources. Um, we use AdFab, um, the Mass Spec Lab, and uh, quite often, or at least um, some of the faculty and people in my department do. And many of the customers that have come to use the wet center have um, at a minimum shown a sincere interest in, in collaborating with some of the other uh, facilities, but many of them have used the AdFab shop to uh, make prototype parts, including um, X2O, who will speak to that in the next part of this presentation. 
Um, also on UMass campus, of course, as you all know, there's an, there's an expert in every field. So typically if you have a, a question, there's, there's a way to find the answer from campus. And the Pioneer Valley is a great place to live and work. Um, so a few past projects just to kind of show some of the, the scale of what we do. Um, the uh, images on the left and middle are of a um, membrane filtration system that we um, worked with in 2016 and 2017. A company from outside of Boston um, had partnered with a, a French-based membrane manufacturing uh, company and, and needed to uh, challenge test the membranes and, and do some you know um, real hardcore running of them to see how, how well they last and what's their cleaning frequency and things of that nature. So at the same time, the town of Amherst and UMass are have been looking at uh, ways to improve or increase their reuse plan on campus. Um, the Amherst, UMass currently uses about 350 million gallons of water per year, and they use 75 million gallons of reused wastewater from the town of Amherst wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's my understanding that the campus believes they can, can double or triple that amount of wastewater that's, that's used for things like flushing toilets and cleaning, uh, flushing sewers watering plants. But in order to do that, you have to have what's called a class A reuse permit. So uh, the water has to go under very strict treatment and quality standards before it can be uh, reused for anything that might be exposed to people um, like water in athletic fields. Uh, so you see the image on the right is a purple pipe. Uh, UMass Amherst has a lot of purple pipe. In fact, I believe you can find it in aisles. If you, if you look at it overhead or in the bathrooms at some of the Plumbing fixtures, you notice that they're painted purple, and that is the national code for reused water. So if you see a purple pipe, that means it's uh, wastewater that has been treated to a standard that is uh, safe for non-potable purposes, like uh, flushing toilets. Um, another big project that we have going on currently at the Wet Center, um, this is called the Oxygenic Photogranules Pilot, OPG for short. And uh, wastewater treatment uses a tremendous amount of energy, uh, about somewhere between two and 5% of the nation's energy goes to water and wastewater treatment. And over half of that is actually used for just feeding oxygen into wastewater so that the, the bugs that are in the water are happy and, and digest the waste that we feed them. Uh, this project, which started in ELAB 2 in 2011 or 2010 or so, um, uh, uses an algal granule that produces oxygen naturally from photosynthesis and light. And so um, hypothetically, these algae could uh, completely eliminate the energy that's required for pumping oxygen into um, wastewater treatment plants around the country or around the world. And the tank on the picture on the bottom is the world largest, uh, to our knowledge at least, the world's largest pilot of this technology. Um, it started out on a windowsill and then in a beaker under a light bulb and has gone um, up since then. But uh, just about a month ago, uh, they uh, put online a 30,000 liter tank. Um, which, so you can see the full size ladders on the left and right. It's, not, it's a pretty large tank and uh, it's currently up and operational at the Wet Center now. Um, and it will continue to run all through most of the winter and hopefully for years to come to demonstrate to um, venture capitalists that are interested in, in water investments, but you know, ultimately to municipalities and um, the industrial world that, that this type of technology is viable uh, to be, uh, to save a whole bunch of money. Um, so this, we're uh, really excited for this pilot. Um, and then a really quick history of the, the wet center. Um, as I said, this, the wet center was uh, actually came online in 1972. Uh, these pictures I dated to about 1975. Um, during the Clean Water Act, the state invested a lot of money in uh, water and wastewater treatment. Um, and so the faculty at UMass at the time were innovative enough to leverage the state to build the original wet center or the pilot plant, wastewater pilot plant. And a lot of work was conducted um, between 1975 and 1985. Numerous papers came out and lots of consulting with Massachusetts and Northeast municipalities. Um, by 1985, the building went offline, and from 1985 to 2014, it was more or less vacant. Um, these are the pictures of what it looks like 
looked like when I first walked into it in 2014. And then in 20, this, these pictures are from 2020 or so, but you can see we were able to do a modest renovation, make, make everything work, uh, clear the vegetation on the site and start bringing in these large scale pilots uh, for doing our research. Um, we're very appreciative of the core facilities as well as physical plant, campus planning, um, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering for, for allowing us to do this renovation on a very modest budget and um, without, you know, without having, going through what some might call the proper channel to, to renovate a building, but we we're up and running and we've had over a dozen projects. I think Andrew mentioned we've had 20 vouchers, but um, many of those are repeat customers. Uh, these projects last anywhere from uh, three months to three years. So uh, it's, it's a great place to, to be and work. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Michael Murphy, who's a wet center client, um, has been for uh, the year of 2020, more or less. Um, I first met Michael in 2014 through Dr. Reckow, and uh, Michael was the Director of Water Innovation at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Michael was working with Dave on an EPA grant focused on assisting small water treatment systems in the U.S., and Michael was also one of the pioneers leading the effort to bring the wet center back to life from its 20-year status of being abandoned. Um, and that's a big reason why I wanted to invite Michael to be the guest speaker for the wet center. Uh, while the Mass CEC worked, uh, Michael worked with the Mass CEC and uh, uh, while with the Mass CEC, Michael worked with the wet center on um, two membrane filtration projects, including the one that I showed you prior, um, and was always an advocate to get UMass to in increase its wastewater reuse program. Michael also played a key role in the 2018 feasibility study um, of building a new modern wet center, um, and he still advocates to this day uh, for, for us, and we're uh, forever grateful for, for his advocacy and support uh, of the wet center. Uh, more recently, Michael has taken a role with a startup called X2O to develop a low-cost water quality measurement device which utilizes advanced imaging capabilities of modern smartphones, um, along with classical chemistry, uh, to measure uh, water, um, targeted uh, homeowners' water. During 2020 and 2021, Michael and his team came to X2O uh, to bring this idea from conception to a minimum viable product. And now Michael will go into detail to explain his experience working with the Wet Center. Thank you, Patrick. Um, let's go ahead and switch our screens real quick. There we go. All right, everyone see that all right and hear me okay? Looks good, we can hear you fine. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Patrick and Lisa and Andrew. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity um, to present X2O and talk about our experiences uh, working with the WET Center. Um, you know, Patrick kind of laid out a little bit of my bio there. I'll just add a few tidbits uh, before, you know, meeting uh, Dave Reckow and, and Patrick, I, uh, I worked more in the international development realm, uh, all water projects, big projects, small projects, but mostly focused on the Caribbean and, and Latin America, Central and South America on water projects. And then once I got to Massachusetts, really uh, started working more domestically, even though there's still an international component to this very day. Um, and at times pretty significant as, as Dave, Re Dave Reckow knows quite well. Um, you know, we've looked to build up Massachusetts and our water innovation economy and, and connect with, with other, um, you know, water sectors around uh, the, the, the globe. But what I'm going to talk about today is, is a little bit about X2O, <clears throat> tell you a little bit about us, and then um, talk about some of our work at the Wet Center. And then, um, you know, kind of a look ahead, what, what we're doing right now and, and as we look forward. Um, and then, you know, I really want to highlight how important it's been for X2O to work with the Wet Center. We really couldn't have done this work in this way um, without the Wet Center and without, you know, the Massachusetts Voucher Program. That, that has been such a, an important aspect to what we're talking about today. That coupled with the MassCC Internship Program, where we're able to pull in, you know, two UMass Amherst 
um, interns and at times even more, um, you know, really just an invaluable set of resources there for any startup to be able to tap into. So, um, you know, I hope those never go away. Those are great for the economy here in Massachusetts and all the startups involved that would like to, you know, uh, advance their technology into commercial commercialization. Um, so let me, let me move forward. Um, So just a little bit about X2O, um, you know, what we're trying to accomplish here is really look at all the data that's available and the data that we can create. And when I talk about data, I'm going to be talking about water quality data. Um, all that data that we can access and create through our solution and other solutions that are already out there um, and really crowdsource that uh, so that people across sectors really have a greater awareness and trust and value in their water. You know, we really see this cutting across all, you know, sectors, government, um, the, the, the individual person, businesses, and any organization, so that we're, we, we really care more about water. And how, how do we aim to do this? Um, putting together a comprehensive, yet very affordable, so we're talking about a consumable uh, water quality sensor here, you use it one time, um, and close to real time. We have different reactions taking place. Some happen quickly, some happen, you know, in closer to 10 minutes. But looking at pairing that with a mobile phone application um, that then takes a picture of your water sample, I'll, I'll talk more about this, and then begins to give you some uh, feedback about the sample you just took. So you can then make some decisions about it. Um, moving on. <clears throat> so, our technology package really encompasses a number of things. Uh, first and foremost, and what we spent most of our time at the wet center working on was this sensor. Um, you know, a consumable sensor with 10 parameters, four of which we found work well. And, and those are the four that we focused on, those four being water hardness, chromium six, chlorine, and aluminum. There's others, heavy metals and pH, Stuff we didn't really, we started to get into pH. We never really got to the others as well, but we began to focus on those four parameters that worked um, in this first round. Um, pairing that water quality sensor, as I said before, with an application, uh, which is in really early stages of development. Um, so equipping the user uh, with that sensor and that app so that they can then, you know, access data about the sample they just took and Potentially, the vision would be potentially other uh, data as well that's already publicly available. And this word crowdsource, we hear it a lot. Crowdsource data analytics, what does that mean? Well, crowdsource being lots of people taking samples, taking pictures with their phone, getting the, the data, the water quality data, and then the analysis coming back from servers to that user, right? So um, really able to pull all that data. And also there's this social networking component, right? If you wanna share your results, say with your neighbor or perhaps a colleague who works in a watershed or colleagues who work on other watersheds so you can compare and contrast water quality um, as you know, they might wanna do, uh, that's, that's kind of where we think this can be. And then also providing reporting about the water quality. So you, you take a picture of the water sample within minutes, you know, your phone starts to populate with, with water quality information and reporting. Um, and so that, that these four things together make up sort of the, the package uh, that we are working on. And as I said, what we mostly focused on um, with the wet center are the first two and really the first one, the sensor, and then to some extent, the, the mobile app. We thought we'd get further with the mobile app, but it presents an opportunity as we scope out projects going forward. Um, so just real quick, excuse me, um, intelligent water testing. You know, so what is that? Well, here's a bit of the methodology for how this would work, uh, you know, in a user's hands. You fill a glass or you take a sample from a groundwater source or a surface water source, uh, and you will dip that sensor and you'll see pictures of, of where we're at now um, in, a, in a few slides. Dip that sensor into that glass, wait a few minutes, take it out, and you'll start to see some colorimetric changes 
on the sensor itself. And then you get your phone, you open up the app, log in, um, and then you start taking pictures of it. Uh, and then that information, that picture gets sent um, you know, to a server, and then you, you will start receiving that data back about the, the, the water quality that, that you have within a range, right? We're not, this is not um, something that we're not going to seek EPA approval, right? For a, a very uh, accurate um, and specific uh, level. We're looking for a range that gives the user a sense of quality. Um, and then you can share your results, results as we, we spoke about um, a few minutes ago. Crowdsourcing those that then help users uh, perhaps one of the things we want to do, and we haven't worked on yet, but this is kind of conceptual, is as more and more people use this uh, when we commercialize, you can begin to geolocate all these different samples on a map, and then you'll see, you know, a heat map, essentially, of, of hot spots with different, you know, water quality parameters in different locations. So then people can see what's going on in a neighborhood, a watershed. Um, you know, and, and however, wh whatever the tar target segment might be. Um, <clears throat> you know, competitive advantages. Uh, you know, I don't know if all of these play out, but this is at this point where we see our potential advantages. You know, first of all, being an all-in-one solution, looking across different parameters with one device um, in one sample. Right now, we've talked about four different parameters that we, we believe work pretty well. Others that we think that we can make work in, in subsequent projects. Um, fast results. Um, you don't have to put it in a box and send it off to a laboratory and wait three weeks. You, if you do that, you know, with a different solution, you certainly get, um, you know, much more, you know, I, I will call it granular, accurate information about that sample. But again, we're looking, you know, for that acceptable range, uh, the simplicity of the design and, and the mobile app, like everybody's, you know, using apps, right? Kids, everybody, most people. Um, so having that in their hands and providing something that's simple and usable um, is, is where we see an advantage. And then just having that, that binary response, we'll call it, uh, for pre-screening or just ha having a snapshot is your water in these parameters within the acceptable range um, that is set out, right? And then, you know, more analytics. I think this is where we really see our company, not so much a water quality sensor company, but really a, a data analytics company. And our data is water quality. Uh, and so providing this information that is actionable and visualized to a user is where we see us becoming most successful and most valuable. And at least that's, that's the feedback we get. And, you know, being in the industry a while, that's in, in part, that's where the industry is going, like more information about all this data that's out there that we can then use in a more actionable way. Um, so kind of a set of competitive advantages there, um, but all together, uh, believe we have an opportunity to carve out a niche and perhaps even more than that. Um, but first we have to, you know, perfect what we're working on. And that's where the wet center has been, you know, very helpful. Um, target segments, you know, we've done a bunch of thinking about this um, and, and just also research and market intelligence. You know, when we're talking about a solution like, like we are, uh, that potentially has broad application, but, Focusing in on one or two areas as beachhead markets, which we do need to, um, you know, do some market sizing. But thinking about B to C, homeowners and, and neighborhood associations um, that really want to have more focus and more awareness about the the potable water coming in, um, you know, or out of their their faucets. Um, B to B, you know, a lot of different potential, um, you know, businesses here could potentially. Uh, have an interest in our devices, like a pre-screening tool. Um, and again, same with utilities down at the bottom. Uh, we've gotten a little bit of feedback about that where, you know, we're not trying to replace, um, you know, an EPA certified device here that costs many thousands of dollars uh, that a utility would, would have to have to meet permits each day. That's not 
what we are and what we are trying to be. Um, but perhaps a, a pre-screening tool <clears throat> and then education and outreach. I mean, I, I, I can see this being used, uh, you know, in elementary schools for education purposes for, with students um, and university research, like what the WET Center is doing. Um, Patrick and, and Chris over there and, and the students that work with them, they, you know, they could use this if it, you know, if when it's uh, ever available in a commercialized way to kind of, uh, again, pre-screen and measure against other more expensive equipment they have. Um, and then watershed groups, I've mentioned, perhaps that's not really a B2G, that's more of a nonprofit, um, but a watershed group or um, river, uh, river groups and things like that um, might, might want to care Care, might care to have something like this in their pocket when they're out um, as, as a, a pre-screening tool. Um, and then just, you know, re projected revenue models. How would this company make money? Um, you know, we are pre-revenue, uh, but a couple ways. First of all, retail and online sales, you know, through the app. Um, subscription, you know, a, you know, like a monthly or an annual or quarterly subscription on the app, you know, you essentially would get the sensors sent to you free of charge. You, cause you're providing data to us, you know, customers are gonna be very valuable to us. We'd almost wanna pay them to use, use the technology at least early on. So we are acquiring more information about how well our device works so we can continue perfecting it. Um, you know, so paying a subscription, um, advertising and affiliate marketing, you know, through the mobile app. Um, you know, advertising any kind of uh, other equipment that we would enter into partnerships with, and then affiliate marketing, you know, calling out um, other, I'll say, um, sort of, I, I guess, technologies that can benefit from, from working with X2O or just have some sort of relationship, um, you know, good potential revenue there. Uh, and then the analytical content. So what are you going to get back? You're going to get back some reporting, some information, and that's what you really want to pay for. Uh, so you, you have that snapshot uh, of your water. Um, <clears throat> so let, let's move into the, the portion of this where x 2 worked with the wet center. Uh, we did that between June 2020, approximately, and April 2021. Um, but before we we did that, you know, very, very, you know, early stage R&D company. I mean, TRL one or two at max, um, you know, looking to build a small team uh, here in the United States. So you see at the top right of the slide, you know, we're an Alcor company. Alcor is a much larger company in Almaty, Kazakhstan. One of the founders of that company is the founder of our company. And he, you know, lived in Boston for quite a while and met him at MIT some years ago through some of their water events. Um, you know, he, he wants a, he wants X2O to be, you know, New England based in the United States. So what we had to do was begin to think about all of his early stage R and D that he did it at the Alcor lab. Um, but, but do it here. So then that moves us into our work with the wet center and the key ob project objectives. We had to do everything that our founder had done, but replicate it first and foremost. That was all the R&D troubleshooting. What worked, what didn't, replicate the chemistries. We had all of the chemistries given to us uh, by the R&D team from Alcor. We needed to replicate those. How well did those work over here? Uh, you know, what chemicals could we get? What reagents could we get and not get? So we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, you know, also, we wanted to think about the design and the materials. Um, you know, we spent some time um, early on uh, with Dave Follette and the AdFab Lab at UMass Amherst talking about different materials. We looked at three different materials, settled on two, um, and then Dave um, and his lab, you know, burned up quite a few um, of these markers uh, that we used in our work at the Wet Center. Uh, but we also wanted to think about modifications to this marker um, and how we might be what how we might need to make changes to it um, and the form factor and and what really worked. Um, we also, you know, one of the things we wanted to do with the wet center 
was use different kind of you know water samples, uh, tap water, like like Patrick said, all kinds of different you know water strengths and types of water are available to the wet center, making the wet center extremely unique in that regard. Um, so we couldn't have replicated what we did anywhere else based on all the different kinds of water that Patrick has available. I wish X2O was further along to be able to take advantage of all of those, but perhaps in subsequent projects we will be. Um, but yeah, using tap water, using water from the Mill River um, and so on and so forth. Um, and also we wanted the team um, out there in the wet center to work with the earliest version of, of the mobile app that the founder of our company had developed um, and see how well it worked. Um, and we found that it didn't work that well and we needed to um, spend a lot more time on it. And so that would be something that we need to do going forward um, and perhaps just rewrite some of the code or a lot of the code in a different language, mostly being Python, which is the predominant um, application language that we need to use. So we wanted to work with that app, find out how well it worked or didn't. Um, and really the overarching goal of our entire time at the Wet Center was advance what we had to a minimum viable product. So if we have to sell it, uh, we can sell it. Um, I would say we got close, but we're not really there yet. I mean, you know, if, if, we, if we're able to, you know, stick with it, we're on pause right now due to funding constraint, constraints not anything connected to the voucher program. That's really on our side and our parent company side. Uh, that's another story. But if we're able to acquire that funding and restart, I really see us, you know, advancing towards an MVP, you know, within a year. Um, and so we've set out a budget to do that. So when we, you know, raise some money, that's really what we're raising money to do is it finish the work we've started with the wet center um, either at the Wetson or somewhere else uh, and, and advance to that MVP. Um, so the next set of slides, you're going to see a lot of pictures and I'm going to describe them. I will uh, invite Patrick to chime in at any point. Patrick and, and Chris, who I believe is on this call, they were out at the Wet Center every day. I was out there one day a week. I live in Somerville in the Boston area. So I would drive out one day a week, spend the day um, but certainly they were very, very close to the team, the UMass Amherst team or the students um, and the actual chemistry work and the work that we did. But starting with this slide, you see the top left diagram. So this is all pre wet center, right? So this that first diagram up here is kind of where we started and, and kind of where we're at right now. Um, and you come down here and this is this is kind of a home. 3D printer, right? And we burned up a bunch of these and get to this. And then down here on the bottom right is just lab work going on at the Alcor labs. And it looks very similar to what we did at the wet center. Lots of chemistry early on to perfect these, these reactions in a form factor like this. So very small form factor. This is about the size of a credit card, but a little bit more square, right? So it's not very big. And so you have you know, small volumes um, in, in, in small chambers like these, and that's where the reactions happen, you know, and, and here's 10 different parameters. Like I said earlier, we got four of them that really worked. Um, and just to really point out, what happens is all of these channels right here, there's a perforation and water, the water sample will enter a small perforation into the channel where there's a reagent for a different reagent for each, um, each uh, different uh, contaminant. And then you start seeing color metric changes. Um, there's another small perforation at this end to let air out. So you can get the water to come in and the air can, can, can go out. Um, moving ahead, just a few more pictures. Now this is at the wet center. So what we would do is do these reactions in vials um, and then pipette into our markers different, you know, different solutions. Um, and these are different concentrations, these tags up here. Here's an overhead shot as well, a little easier to see, um, and pipette. And so you're only going to see three or four because those are the ones that primarily worked. Um, and so we just focused our time and effort there um, because we can have a, an MVP, a minimum viable product with, with four. We can, have, we can have one with one. 
We just need one good sense or one good parameter to work in the mobile app to, to do what we need it to do. And then we have our MVP. And so we're, we're on track to have four. Um, and then, you know, here, top left, after, well, let me just go back one. After we would set, you know, pipette solutions into these markers, we would take one and put it in a light box, like you see here. And this is setting up a light box. These are overhead shots of a light box that we, we built. It's pretty rudimentary, right? I mean, we're just trying to standardize and balance the white light. And that's what an advanced mobile app will do for us. You don't need to do this as a user, but in the lab at this stage, this is what we had to do to balance the white as much as possible. And then over here, um, you just see another example you know, different shutter speeds. And, and we, we did it both with an Android phone and, a, and an iPhone. And this is Chromium. Most of what we're going to talk about in this presentation is Chromium. Um, and we settled, well, resin 12 is the material. We used what was called resin 12. And then we used another material called Vero White. Um, and then these are the RGB values. R red, is, G is green, B is blue. And these are the, the values for each one. Um, that kind of give us a sense on what that color is. Um, <clears throat> and then here's, this is, um, so we, as I said, we, we did the solutions or the reactions in vials before we would put them in the, uh, the markers. This is chromium, 10 mil samples of, of chromium across different concentrations. Um, and as you can see, we get darker, uh, color metric changes with higher concentrations. Um, and then for each parameter, we did this many, many times. Um, Chris and Patrick know very well, we went through quite a few different samples doing this. Um, and then going from what you see here in these vials, you know, and building, you know, calibration curves like this. Um, so, Patrick, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe our MCL was 0.1 ppm. Um, yep, the, the EPA MCL is yeah, 0.1. EPA MCL. So milligram per liter. you can see three different sources of water here, uh, tap water, mill, mill river, and then the private well. Just calibrating and comparing um, with each sample uh, with the target stock of, of chromium-6 that we had. Um, and we did this across all the different um, parameters um, or contaminants multiple times. Um, and then here is a, another chart that kind of just illustrates the, the RGB trend, you know, of green was the, you know, the most interesting one here where uh, as the concentration really increased, as we had, you know, samples with higher concentrations, of our, of our chromium stock, um, our green value uh, decreased. So that's on the, the y-axis here, the color value. Um, and so we'd see those color metric changes over, uh, over the course of you know, different concentrations. Um, and again, the three sources, the tap water, the mill river, and then uh, the water well. Um, so our final report has lots of graphs that look just like this, uh, comparing different sources um, over different concentration ranges and color values. Um, right here is, I, we put this in this morning just to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, th this color wheel, right? RGB color wheel. This is what we want our you know, what we'd be driving for a mobile application to be able to do. There's lots of applications that can look at a color and you can see a, a poor photo on the right of the phone, right? It, it can look at a color and give you an RGB value based on uh, this color wheel. Um, so having our mobile application being able to utilize that after it is able to balance all of the white, right? So white balancing um, and standardizing all of the light that it sees. And of course, with you know, image stabilization, um, having that all incorporated within the app that's working with the camera phone, 
or the phone camera. There's only a few makers of phone cameras in the world. So, you know, we, we have to be able to uh, work well with those, those cameras. Um, that's where we're going next with the application. Read, write in Python and, and have it be able to really stabilize and standardize all the light that it sees. So you don't, you know, no user is going to build a, a photo box out of white paper. That's, that's pure bench scale R&D work um, at its finest, I, I would say. Um, but this is where the mobile app, you know, will do this for us. Um, and so the color wheel, you know, we didn't really know this going into the wet center. At least I hadn't thought about it, but it became a revelation that that's, we need to make sure our app utilizes an RGB color wheel. Um, I think our founder had thought about it um, and done some work on it, um, but he was the one who developed the first application that we used. Um, and so he was more versed in this, this aspect of it. Uh, but it just gives you a sense on what the what would need to happen with our, our mobile app. Um, and then this is just a few shots of the team in the wet center uh, working, working during COVID, obviously. Um, I have to say, you know, I've been working, from, I'm still working from home, but, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun to come out to Amherst and also very eye-opening um, to work in the lab or just be present while the work was being done by Patrick and Chris. And you see Ani and Jerry there and, and then the top right Bridget's there. Um, you know, very, very impressive students, um, you know, mechanical engineers, but capable of all kinds of different work. I mean, we did a lot of chemistry work. We did some mechanical engineering, um, a, a lot thinking through the mobile app. So just very capable students. I felt very fortunate to have them through the Mass CEC internship program, but, you know, UMass Amherst students. Um, so, um, you know, it's kind of, kind of sad we couldn't have continued back in April. Um, both Ani and Jerry are now grad students. I'm not actually sure what Bridget's up to. I know Chris and, and, um, and Patrick know. But... The state of Utah. Okay. The, so she's not around system. anymore water rights um but yeah just uh, a lot of fun you know yeah here we go the benefits i mean you know we couldn't have done this work without the wet center and the voucher program um and i, I honestly i'll throw in the mass cc internship program there as well that's separate it's not going anywhere i, I don't believe the wet center is going anywhere the wet center has proven itself you know time and time again um you know, the voucher program is, is one of the best programs out there. I mean, I, I worked for the state at Mass CC and ran a bunch of different grant programs and they're great grant, grant programs, don't get me wrong, but, um, you know, the voucher program, it, it was very easy to work with, uh, you know, through Patrick and, you know, Patrick with Andrew. Um, it just made it very easy to access the money and, and use the funds at the wet center, it really helped us advance closer to a, an MVP. It helped us, um, you know, come to some new revelations. Uh, we wouldn't have found a center with the, those kind of water sources and capabilities and just flexibility. And obviously, having a relationship with Patrick and, and Dave, you know, you can't put a price on that when it comes time to trying to advance a technology. Of course, I could have created and, and um, nurtured other relationships in different labs, but again, the wet center is quite unique. Um, so, you know, I'm really fortunate, you know, that we were able to, to spend some time out there. I hope we can again. Um, I believe that will be on us. Um, you know, I'm hoping that the, the voucher program uh, remains intact. Um, and, and the look ahead for X2O, um, I've kind of alluded to some of it here. We got to work on the app. Um, we need to think about two stage reactions in our marker. You know, that would open up all sorts of other capabilities for X2O if we can do two stage reactions in the marker, not just one stage reactions. Um, so that we have to think about the form factor there a little more, which we have done. Um, Chris and, and Patrick and I done a little bit of that, but that would be part of a scope looking ahead. Um, also just in packaging and, and the pricing, and getting a better sense of um, the community around manufacturing of something like this, 
here. I've done some work on that um, already, but that would that would uh, have to continue. And then um, the mobile app. That's where that's where the most valuable part of everything we're going to do, uh, you know, stems from is the robust usability uh, of the, the mobile app. So we'll need to spend quite a bit of time there. Um, and then what I'm spending most of my time right now uh, doing is, is looking at um, strategic partner or and or some kind of acquisition uh, uh, from a larger company. Um, because um, Alcor, I think Alcor, our parent company, they're gonna they're gonna let us go, or more accurately, we're asking them to go because they've been less engaged, and and we need to um, we need to have more local representation. Um, and so I'm spending most of my time with that. Um, but once we're able to resolve that to some degree. I really look forward to you know accessing these resources again and continuing our work, hopefully at the Wet Center. Um, so I will stop right there and um, and open it up to any questions. Um, I believe Patrick and I are available for at least I'm not sure how long, 10, 15 minutes or however long it is um, to to answer some questions. And thanks again uh, to UMass Amherst and Patrick and Andrew and Lisa and, and Dave and Chris. Um, again, so valuable to, to work with all of you for X2O. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Mike. I know we have a small audience, but if anyone has questions, we're happy to field them. And if not, it's totally fine. Feel free to reach out to me as well. I've got my uh, email address there at the bottom. Um, can go into more detail about any aspect that you heard. Um, All right, well, I guess if there's no other questions, then I'll close out the seminar. Okay, well, thanks again. Thank you, thank you Michael. Thank you, Patrick. That was very interesting. And thank you all for attending today's seminar. Our next seminar is Tuesday, November 16th, which will, which will be light microscopy. And our guest speakers will be Pat Wasworth from Biology and Joseph DiPietro from Nikon. Also, I would like to remind you that Friday, November 12th, we have a special seminar sponsored by CH2P and CPHM Dr. Mark Shellhammer, how to send people to Mars without killing them, a systems approach to health and performance. And all of the information on both of these seminars can be found on our website. Hope to see you all there. Have a great afternoon, everyone.